you know, D David's presentation was kind of a bummer. <laughs> and um, I have bad news. If you think that traditional university press publishing is the backstop <laughs> to uh, judicial humanities, uh, you know, my presentation starts with the line, the publishing model of the humanities monograph is fundamentally broken, almost on life support, and without an intervention, it's going to get worse. So here we go. Um, so I, I do actually have an abiding passion for the work that university presses do. Um, we're on the side of angels, I always say, but regrettably, we're also distressingly close to irrelevance. The academy and scholarship and publishing are all changing at lightning speeds, and university presses are built like dreadnoughts. It can be argued that this is a strength in a world where there are carnival barkers yelling things like disruption on every corner, that perhaps the majestic indifference of the university press publishing model is just what you need. But I worry that without a significant reimagination of our work, that we'll end up either mothballed or adrift in a vast sea. It has always been hard to run a university press. When I arrived, my predecessor gave me a tour of the press, and there was a cabinet rather augustly marked the director's correspondence. And I remember just kind of going through it, and I found a letter that was written from the press director to the head, I think it was ARL, and it talked about you know, the, the, uh, the crisis of monograph publishing. I thought, okay, this is the letter I need to read. It's the skeleton key to everything. It's going to be my crash course uh, on publishing. It wasn't written by my predecessor. It was written by hers, and it was dated June 1974, when I had just graduated from the sixth grade. <laughs> so it turns out that monograph publishing has always been in crisis, and we've always been worried that technology was going to uh, be happening so fast that if we didn't take advantage of it, then we'd be on the verge of obsolescence. So it was ever thus. But when the Great Recession hit in 2008 and 2009, at the same time that publishing was trying to figure out the shift to digital, there were a lot of predictions that the game was up. Many people in the university press community will talk about how great our predecessors had it in the 60s and 70s and 80s when there was money being invested in universities, and they were salad days when there were reliable streams of income from libraries and scholars and students, all of whom were comparatively flush with funds to buy our books. But I have to say it was a pretty terrible publishing model. We created bespoke physical objects and shipped them into elite institutions only to one day have them be deaccessioned. For those of you who aren't librarians, that means it goes in a black bag next to the dumpster behind the library. <laughs> I have a full-time employee whose job it is to find copies of those old books we supposedly published so well so that we can digitize them and bring them back into print. The truth is the generation of the 60s, 70s, and 80s should be envying us. We can disseminate our work exponentially more broadly and more quickly than ever before. It should be a golden age for us right now. A new model for publishing the humanities monograph sits at the intersection of how readers engage concurrently with digital and print. So I want to take a brief summary of how we survived the recession and the digital shift and where we sit regarding digital and print. For a while, publishers were surprisingly happy with the shift to digital. There were new e-tailers everywhere. There was sales growth and higher margins. And in fact, remember this is 2008, 2009. E-book sales growth was one of the few pieces of good news in an otherwise very dismal retail landscape. Sales went from a trickle to triple-digit increases with no end in sight. And then, the end came in sight. As the economy improved, ebook sales inflected. As devices proliferated and developed other affordances, sales inflected. As retailers started suing publishers and publishers started suing websites, sales inflected. Not only have sales, uh, ebook sales declined, declined, but print sales have increased and show signs of continued increases in the future. The durability of the codex is important. People have an affection for it in ways that they didn't for other analog products. But print also has a utility and a set of benefits that are distinct from digital. Not to mention, most ebook products are pretty underwhelming. The <laughs> devices themselves were arguably substandard. We call them Betamax machines and not quickly improved upon. And these devices also became a source of distraction. Reading was already in competition for people's time. Now the very device we wanted them to read on was surfacing that competition. So where did that leave us? Print is still here, it's definitely where the money's at, but in a world of scholarly research, investigations originate digitally. Dissemination can happen most effectively digitally, plus there's really cool stuff happening digitally. The combination of mission-driven dissemination paired with some philanthropic generosity is creating a new era of digital innovation, especially in the scholarly area. It's grounded in three key notions. The first is digital humanities, and these are two very hard to read examples here, but I don't need to explain DHD. One is, uh, I think it's a visualization of Absalom and Absalom from a Cambridge University Press book. And on the right is a uh, website published by Stanford University Press called Enchanting the Desert. 
The second trend of our new digital era is the notion of fungible content. The way that people discover scholarly books is much different than a generation ago, often happening at the chapter level. So we have to disaggregate and chapterize our books. But then entire books are also being placed into larger aggregations, creating network environments of humanity scholarships. So books are being pulled apart and aggregated at the same time. <coughs> and the third notion is the notion of open access. OA means different things to different people, but in its purest form, it describes an egalitarian, inclusive model where the publishing and scholarship is funded as a service and not as products, so that final outputs are completely accessible and reusable. So these digital trends are all great and encouraging, but what is the role of publishers in these environments? DH and fungibility and OA can't be optimized unless there is widespread, essentially open digital access. But where is the funding model in giving away access? OA is notionally unsaleable. If we are in the business of dissemination of scholarship and learning, OA is by far the most effective method with incredibly small incremental costs. Nothing else is even close, but publishing has costs. And if cost recovery is not funded, how will you keep what's good about the system, which is mainly the intensive editorial intervention? In a world of information abundance and fake news, the filtering, credentialing, and amplification we do are services that have values to libraries and scholars and students and humanities and the general public. These are all activities worth investing in, and they should be preserved in any publishing model. So I'm going to argue that what we need is a hybrid digital first model where we publish highly discoverable open digital editions with trailing print volumes available for deep, immersive reading. Put another way, it's a model that invests in digital and marginalizes the bespoke physical formats we've conventionally focused on. Just a little bit of background here. At UNC Press, four and a half years ago, we received a million dollar grant from the Mellon Foundation to expand the publishing services platform we own called Long Leaf Services. It used to be a customer service and fulfillment kind of back end uh, tool that was helping uh, six presses. But with the million dollar grant, we expanded into a very broad range of scaled back end publishing services doing all sorts of things like sales representation, building websites, printing, managing metadata, exhibits, copy editing, design, all kinds of things. We now work with over 20 presses, which is one in seven of the American University Press community. And then last year, we asked Mellon for another million dollars to use Longleaf as a common platform to try this new digital-first model, where publishing activities are uncoupled and standardized. We're branding this the Sustainable History Monograph Pilot. It stipulates that conventional monograph publishing is done at a high loss, on an average of $20,000 deficit per book. And I'll talk more about the specific finances at the end. It also stipulates that our legacy workflows are print-centric with trailing digital editions. We want our 19 participating presses to acquire and credential a book in a traditional way, which is the stage one activity you see there, then turned over to us at Longleaf, essentially, at the moment that you would begin copy editing. We'll handle that, as well as composition and format preparation. But it's done in standardized ways, that, and using web-based tools which will dramatically accelerate the traditional publishing timelines. We'll release the ebook, and then three months later, the print book becomes available, and that's stage two. By uncoupling the different stages of publishing, and by publishing in digital-first forms, you can drive down costs, and you can separate activities that have to be done at the individual press versus those which can be done at scale through Longleaf. After the book is published using stages one and two, a press can evaluate the impact the book is having and then exercise an option to republish it in a more traditional, bespoke way, and that's stage three. The Sustainable History Monograph Pilot will publish between 75 and 150 monographs in open digital editions. So why all the funny rules? Think of it as a lab experiment attempting to test the legitimacy of digital formats. These digital editions need to get reviewed, they need to win award, they need to help professors get promotion and tenure as well as do capacity building for presses to learn to publish digitally. And it will prove that open digital editions are accessed, cited, and used in much higher volume than print ever could be. I have to say presses themselves are pretty reluctant to do this. They'll go back to nostalgic about the good old days of university press publishing. This digital model will be superior to that, even if it's hard to adjust to. The good news is we have melon money, so we'll just be buying them off. Presses will be fine. <laughs> we'll make them an offer they can't refuse. But the biggest obstacle may be authors who are forced to buy, review, or give awards to their own books. They might want other books to be digital and free, but their own, well, that one needs to be beautiful. Authors, especially historians, you think philosophers are conservative, historians won't like web-based workflows, complicated, standardized <laughs> features, and trailing print, which are all terrible things to historians. But the hypothesis is that they'll buy into our affirmative case for publishing this way. So here's the affirmative case. 
there will be unparalleled access to their scholarship. There's new research coming out of JSTOR that shows a factor of 16 times increase in usage for open digital scholarship over regular paywall content. It also reveals high levels of usage in international and underserved geographies. The content will be optimized for digital discovery and use. Our workflows include, workflows include digital first features like chapter level metadata, digital object identifiers, persistent digital identifiers, all this leading to high levels of digital discoverability and permanence. Authors will be provided with quantitative, standardized usage impact data and analytics from a multitude of OA repositories. Authors will also be provided with qualitative, customer, customized user surveys indicating how books were discovered and used. Manuscripts in the program will be available six to eight months faster, six to eight months faster than in standardized print-centric workflows. I don't really know how this is all gonna to come together. <laughs> Just getting started. But here are some reasons why if it works, and we can embrace a digital first model that we can see a new golden age for university press publishing. So first is the idea of disintermediation. A perennial challenge in publishing is that we don't engage directly with our customers. We ship a copy to a wholesaler who sells it to a bookstore or Amazon, who then sends it to whom? A student, an author, a library, my uncle. They'll never tell. They'll make me buy the information if I want to know. As we learn to engage directly with our readers, whether it's through sales transactions or other forms of engagement, we can improve margins and optimize our publishing strategies while helping authors connect directly with their readers. I mentioned DH a minute ago, which requires, which currently marginalizes traditional publishing, but I believe that for DH to, to be most effective, it can benefit from, from contextualization. DH needs publishing to overcome the notion of just because you can render something digitally doesn't mean that you should. You need to argue the case for it and for what it means, and that is best done in long-form text. There are a couple of tools that have just been being developed with more Mellon funding. One is Fulbright, which is being developed at the University of Michigan. Uh, library and press, and Manifold, which is being developed at Minnesota. Um, these are both partnerships between presses and libraries to build stable platforms for workflows, dissemination, preservation, and multimodal texts. And then even further out into outer space, in the future of AI and machine reading, there's a couple quick examples here. JSTOR uh, has something called the Text Analyzer that lets you copy chunks of text and drag and drop into a box. It'll identify the key terms and some key concepts, and then using linked data, match it to book and journal content in the JSTOR corpus. They also have something called the topic graph that lets you create a visualization of content in their collections so that you can weigh hierarchies of specific ideas as well as find tangentially related content. And then Google has something called Talk to Books, which is kind of like Ask Siri, but only book content is replied. Um, some of these tools might end up being really useful, and others will certainly not. But what they require of publishers is for us to think about digital affordances and discoverability tools. We need to have metadata at the chapter level and use semantic coding and taxonomies that ensure when our content is thrown into vast networks of other content that is discoverable and coherent. But the fundamental reassessment scholarly publishing needs to accept is the unalloyed benefit to open digital access. In fact, we need to double down on free digital or even pirated digital and acknowledge that it's not something to fear but is in fact a key part of discoverability. It's useful to consider a diversion that publishing has had with the music industry, where digital formats were widely embraced by music users because they reduced costs and dramatically improved the user experience. This was catastrophic for the music labels because at the end of the day, there was nothing left to sell. And they fought it by trying to sue their customers into submission. And they actually won many of the legal fights, but lost the war, because fun fact, that's usually the case when you see your customers. In reading, we've seen this growing body of research that for deep, immersive reading, the kind that people do for university press books, people want print. So giving away digital not only doesn't cannibalize print, it helps people discover content they otherwise never would have found and creates new customers for print. So I've avoided um, specifics can talk about money at this point, but I'm going to wrap up here with a couple of macroeconomic perspectives. So a couple of years ago, Ithaca SNR produced a report about the cost to publish a, publish a monograph. It's a lot, in the neighborhood of thirty to $40,000. And then my sales on career, uh, what's called early career monographs, is uh, in the fifteen dollars to $20,000 range. So on average, I commit to a fifteen dollars to $20,000 deficit every time I sign a contract. This is why a number of OA initiatives, including Knowledge Unmatched, un Knowledge Unlatched, and the somewhat amusingly acronymed TOME initiative, that might have subsidies at the $15,000 level. But I've honestly never understood where that number comes from. It feels like a subsidy on the pre on, on, to a press on the rationale that publishing is hard and you should just give us money and say thank you. 
But digital revenue on a monograph is only a couple of thousand dollars, and in many cases, a couple of hundred dollars. <coughs> we have to stop thinking of monograph publishing as cost recovery activity and start thinking of SP for service, funded by institutions. And that's why the uncoupling model is so important. What are the things worth an institution subsidizing? Good peer review? Sure. A $500 license fee to the Associated Press for a book cover? No way. A good copy edit? Yes. An ad in your review of books? No. My salary? Probably not. If we can change our behaviors at university presses by using a more standardized workflow, a per book fee that covered most of the essential services and provided a hedge to a press for a lost e-sale looks more like $5,000 by my assessment. That's why, that's why your colleagues in STEM are paying Elsevier for a single uncopy edited journal article to be in an OA journal. So think, think about that at scale. By some estimates, there are around 4,000 new university press monographs published a year. And at $5,000 a book, that adds up to $20 million. So a lot of money, right? Except right now, libraries are spending tens of millions of dollars on the university press output and only obtaining a small fraction of it. Are there, say, a thousand libraries around the world that would want permanent, unfettered access to 4,000 new university press monographs? If you tiered it, could a third pay $10,000, and another third pay $20,000, and then the wealthiest third pay $30,000? That's how you get to $20 million. It's a decent amount of money, I get it. But in addition to getting 4,000 new books a year, you're injecting much needed steady, steady revenue to university presses. You're supporting scholars, you're supporting public engagement, you're supporting humanities and books and facts and life on Earth. <laughs> I started by talking about how the university press world needs to be willing to change their practices, but the truth is the whole scholarly communications ecosystem needs to consider change. Publishers, but also authors and institutions. If these sustainable history monograph pilot books don't get reviewed or they don't win awards because of prejudices about digital format, then it's game over. Same for promotion and tenure committees. Libraries need to rethink purchasing not as something done by patron demand, a model that tends to surface scholarship that is already well known, but as true collection development. And institutions need to provide the leadership and very modest funding to ensure a strong future for humanities publishing. I tell my staff all the time it's probably never been harder to be in publishing, but it's also never been as exciting. If we get it right, perhaps the next generation won't mock us for how easily we had it. Perhaps we'll say we got it right and ushered in a golden age of books and dissemination and reading. Thank you.